this is the this is just the whole initiative towards keeping eyes on the road kind of thing if they have a head up display a lot of them have heard uh, the instrument cluster usually sends that information so cloud guidance going here uh, traffic data so I, I don't know some most of the navigation systems nowadays have this colorful chart where it tells this route has good uh, this is good it's green some are amber color some are red okay slow moving traffic not move so that information is real time uh, and different regions uses different ways to uh, send traffic data for example europe uses um, rds radio data services this is a fm multiplexed signal uh, so regular audio and then you have data connect at the end multiplexed together um, your vehicle fm antenna will receive it it will parse the data split it out a decoder would then send it out to the head unit the head unit would make sense of the information and it would automatically uh, overlay those um, traffic um, lines right some some areas use digital antenna for example us uses sxm sirius xm um, then there australia uses another similar form so that is another medium some uses dsrc it's called dedicated short range uh, communication this is basically the short for dedicated short range communication this is basically v2x the whole vehicle to vehicle or infrastructure to vehicle communication so japan uses this uh, this is highway beacons if your vehicle passes underneath it and uh, it will beam it to your vehicle and you will know that if this route has uh, dense traffic and it will even suggest alternate routes so this uh, this is all we getting from medium speed bus from high speed bus you'll need vehicle speed um, mostly because if if you're going above a certain speed it will do this uh, some of them chime some of them make those make a red sign on the screen that okay you're going a little above something like that so next up you get two more information from the steering wheel and the wheel sensor <clears throat> this is the steering direction if you're moving the vehicle steering wheel right or left uh, on and um, how what direction your wheel is moving it's a wheel tick sensor that tells how much it has rotated and what direction the reason we have these two is for something called as dead reckoning dead reckoning comes into play when you lose gps data and um, you're maybe driving under a bunch of trees or in a parking garage or where there is a flyover on the top you lose a uh, momentarily lose or for a significant distance lose data in that case what your head unit does is it calculates uh, it goes blind basically it calculates based on your steering direction and your wheel tick sensor and it pretty much uh, and calculates on its own where you are going until you receive reception again <clears throat> so i want you to take notice of the things that you are getting data from the medium speed bus as well as from the high speed bus and this combination is either is defined by the oem or oem as in vehicle manufacturer they want if they want to decide if they want to put a certain ecu on a high speed bus versus but usually this is the this this component stay on the higher speed side there's a more critical function they serve right so the two buses as i have shown that head unit is connected to both this is usually not the case they will have a gateway in between that will do the gating because they are two they are two different speeds so information received here needs to be gated to the right speed and head unit will receive the same information through the medium speed bus uh, another reason could be that the head unit is easily accessible it's on the front and if anybody wants to jack into the high speed bus they can easily pull it out you can put two wires in and uh, you can start reading logs easily on a high speed bus although it is not as easy as at least now 
uh, the make vehicles manufactured these days to jump into uh, the bus. Next up, we got the OBD port. Um, the onboard diagnostic port is usually connected to the gateway, but again, different vehicle architectures work different way. So now this, in a sense, is your entire navigation system. And this, of course, is never complete. There are different OEMs do it differently, and uh, there are a lot more components that come into play. But as you can see, information sharing becomes very easy. The same, um, let's say, kilometer and miles would be used by different ECUs. Uh, the same vehicle speed would be used by different ECUs. And this sharing is what is enabled because of a CAM bus in there. <clears throat> we have the onboard diagnostic port. This, of course, onboard diagnostic port, of course, offers um, navigation related, any diagnostic trouble you have, you're not getting route guidance, you're not getting sound. So if let's say we get a head unit return, somebody returns it back to us uh, during development, or even post production, if it is a major issue. So the first thing we would do if I, I was diagnosing this is I would um, read the logs, see uh, on the bench how this is working. And we know that this information is supposed to be received and we know the message IDs for these. So first thing would be to see if these are received. Um, secondly, if anything is not received, let's say you're not getting um, route guidance on the instrument cluster, right? So I would check if route guidance is gone, gone out of the head unit. If it is going out, then the instrument cluster is not displaying it. That, that kind of troubleshooting you can do using the bus uh, by reading the logs on the bus. If you want to do diagnostics, like right? for example, I can check if there are any DTCs logged. Uh, if DTCs can be logged in the form of, let's say, you are not able to display the um, uh, traffic data, right? So you can check if there is a loss of comp DTC with the uh, radio module, right? Usually radio is inside head unit, but sometimes let's say here, this is only a display controller and there is a radio module separate. So I this guy lost, uh, there's an LOC filed against it, right? Or uh, signal not available from it. Those kind of uh, DTCs can also help the on knowing that this issue has happened in the past and this could have been the reason um, why this was a momentary issue that came up, right? <laughs> Similarly, there are a lot more things you can do. And all this just helps because as we make our vehicles more and more complex, there are diagnosing this and troubleshooting it becomes more and more difficult. And uh, if you were to know, plus knowing historically why it failed, what could go wrong, all these things can become more manageable with a bus that has track of logs and uh, diagnostics. Right. Next up, this is not the complete picture. Of course, there are a lot more things, but this is a very good picture, actually. Um, a low speed bus represented by red. You can see there are um, ECUs that run through this, correct? Now, this could, this could be different in different uh, vehicles, but more or less, I have not seen a low speed bus. Most of them are on a medium speed bus. Um, on a high speed bus, you have, as you can see, there's a gateway here, your ABS uh, for the brakes, engine, trans uh, transmission. So this one transmission's got a higher uh, dedicated powertrain, okay. Similarly, you will have a uh, LIN bus. LIN is a local interconnected network. Sometimes you have smaller functions like making moving the mirror up and down or uh, the seat incline, changing the incline on the seat or um, other stuff. So 
it's a smaller network reporting to a bigger CAN bus, uh, CAN ECU, and the CAN does the gating based on, uh, you know, if the, if this, let's say this is the lock module, if you lock it, this guy has to let everyone know that, you know, the um, doors locked. So it, this will send it on a LIN network. Okay. A little different, it's a little lighter bus. <clears throat> Next up, there is a safety system, safety bus uh, like this one, which controls the occupant restraint system, airbag control system. This is safety because safety is very critical. There, um, there is a initiative in the last five or six years where safety, they, they're clubbing it under ISOs 26262. Uh, functional safety. This is uh, very big. They have some measures in place like um, no single point failure. You will have dual lines where failure will happen and there is a big um, a big checklist that needs to follow for any uh, system that is deemed as safety critical. <clears throat> Similarly, BUS also has that uh, safety features in built in it. So this uh, a combination of all this helps to do keep data within manageable limits and uh, make sure that every ECU has is connected and to a certain extent um, you know controllable there are other newer um, buses in place like for example you've got ethernet uh, no, automotive ethernet uh, especially with the autonomous uh, direction we are heading can sometimes cannot hold the bandwidth so that is another and then there are more fd can fd or flexible data rate this was again an initiative that was uh, extended by bosch this just offers um, a, let's say broader bandwidth with the 8 byte can frame you can send 64 bytes of data a bigger uh, more faster more robust, I got multiple CRC. So this basically they found that, okay, couple decades in and okay, there's a bunch of problems we have, but it's CAN is still good. Let's just make it a little better. So they got CAN FD is backward compatible as in first eight bytes usually go at the same speed. Uh, and then, then if you have bigger um, data frame, then the rest of them go faster. Uh, this just, that's why it's called flexible data rate. Uh, but this enables it to be used with the regular system. So you don't have to um, change your entire um, system. With this, I think we are, I think we are almost at the four, uh, 45 minute mark. Um, we covered um, most of the, on a, on a very introductory level, of course, but I tried and go as much detailed as possible on CAN and diagnostics. These areas individually are very vast and have their own, like deserve more time for to learning this and uh, doing more in this. I encourage everyone to, uh, if nothing, at least if you have vehicle, go in and check for that OBD2 port. Uh, and, and if you can find, of course, you can YouTube and see there are many ways you can hook up an Arduino and a CAN controller and start reading clocks, even if they don't mean much, but you can start getting a feel that your vehicle is much more smarter and a lot of things go inside it than what seems on the surface. Okay, with that said, if you are interested, automotive is a big space, um, at least in US, it is very vast. And uh, there are some, these are some of the job options, career prospects, if you are interested to pursue in this direction. Uh, most of them come in product development because uh, you have about two to three years of a product development cycle where the vehicle manufacturer will manufacture the vehicle and the suppliers who are making individual ECUs will work in accordance with the vehicle timeline and they'll develop their product. Okay. Um, Systems, this is, uh, um, let's say there are four primary product development, there are mechanical, of course, in addition to this, and there is electrical. So everyone uses um, CAN, you'll need to know general understanding of CAN bus, in some cases, more understanding of CAN bus. 
uh, for systems systems comes into picture when there is your system fits into a bigger system for example the vehicle is the bigger system and your system for example you are making the body controller module or in in the in the example we saw the infotainment head unit right the head unit is a system which fits in a bigger system anytime there are system fits in a bigger system there are boundaries there are interfaces and there are problems so you need a system engineer who can who knows who is basically the subject matter expert and who knows what things can go wrong and how your system will behave in a bigger system because you need to understand that your system can essentially you know be responsible for failing the vehicle if it goes rogue or not follows the basic uh, fundamental vehicle specs system engineer um it, they basically take care of all the requirements make sure that all the requirements are met for example you have a power mode where you are in the sleep state and your consumption should be less than 100 microamps so you have to make sure that these are met or there are more complex requirements uh, and usually uh, for a head unit you will have at least 10 to 12 system engineers uh, supporting this uh, system architect that's that's my role um, system architect comes in when you get a new project and the company usually or the vehicle manufacturer usually wants you to develop a system uh, and then you define the boundaries the limits uh, bomb bill of materials based on the requirements what processor speed you need and uh, you usually go back and tell the oem that you know it, this may not work or this is not feasible to implement and all the initial discussion and making sure from your lessons learned you can as you can predict what all things can go wrong and all this information so uh, there is a, also system modeling in play. You can look it up, SysML, UML, that, that kind of stuff also comes into play at the beginning of the project. These are the other ones are just fancy terms for the same thing. Different OEMs use different, uh, different companies use different uh, terms. Feature owner is a more uh, advanced system engineer who owns a feature um, like um, diagnostics. You know, you you make sure that diagnostics is right in that application engineer is engineering sales design release engineer again this is a oem position but they also do the same thing requirements automotive resident more or less the same thing um, on a software side can knowledge is helpful but you would know to you should know to code or for that matter if you are doing uh, software tester to whatever automation tools you use, you gotta know that. Uh, there are more specific um, software engineers like algorithm engineer who design, let's say your fuel injection system or uh, braking system. Those definitely need a more deeper knowledge of CAN bus. And uh, these are basically the architects on the uh, uh, software side who make sure that uh, system is designed correctly um validation this is very big well because um, the validation is like uh, the mirror of software of systems if systems defines the requirements validates validation validates those requirements implemented in the product so a test engineer validation verification uh, all these positions basically mean you are validating the end product um, there are many validation techniques you can do manual validation you can do automated validation you can write scripts to run it overnight there are um, bigger validations that run for 18 weeks there are high temperature validations um, extreme um, uh, robustness validation oh, there's a whole bunch of stuff and uh, validation engineers generally are at the other end of the product development cycle where the product is developed and they validate it. It's a closed loop system. We write requirements, put it in the product, software implements it, validation validates it. There are problems, goes back, redo the same thing. This cycle happens throughout the two years and then the product is developed uh, on different benches. First bench, then vehicle, 
test vehicle, non-sellable vehicle, then sellable vehicle, and then production vehicle that way. Calibration, this usually comes at the very end if, uh, where you need to put the ECU inside the vehicle to know how it is behaving. For example, audio, if you're making speakers, um, the speaker manufacturer will mostly just make it at default settings. Calibration engineer will go inside, see how it sounds, it will change. Um, it has uh, some tools to know um, the different parameters, how they should sound. Uh, or if, if your exhaust uh, calibration, you will check the exhaust uh, fumes and make changes to the powertrain, the, those kind of stuff. Hardware in loop, this is uh, another form where you cannot do prototype testing. You do not have the vehicle ready and or sometimes in a research position where they want to see if this is a viable option. So they do a hardware in loop where they use tools like MATLAB and Simulink and uh, they create a hardware in loop system and then um, or sometimes canalizer and then they um, test if the system is working just as anticipated. Quality quality wise, uh, this is a this is very big also. Uh, quality comes in before and after. Uh, once it's in production, if part gets pulled out of the vehicle, that's a quality concern. A uh, lot of time there are recalls and stuff. So the quality team comes in and they check. There is something called as automotive spice, a spice. Uh, this is a standard in which software development is uh, goes through. And this is uh, it is German standard, but uh, in US, a lot of companies are adopting it. And a spice basically tells you how you should break down a system and how a, uh, rec um, like a rec initial product requirement, how it needs to be broken down and how it needs to, how it can be consumed by all the uh, separate disciplines within product development. And then there are guidelines that you, you need to code along with and all those things. Uh, quality makes sure that all these guidelines are followed. And uh, sometimes even if a company is at going towards it, then they help the company come to that level. A company gets a rating, level one, level two, three, four, five. Standard is level three. Very few have level four. There are no companies with level five, maybe a few in recent years. So those kind of stuff um, will get you, or if you're interested, you can join uh, position in quality. So in a nutshell, this was wrap up. I think, I, I hope I've not gone over on the Q&A time, but uh, I think this is the last slide. Have some credits. 